Welcome and thank you for joining Brad Nickerson and myself, Nancy Furness, for this issue of We've Got Issues. We've Got Issues is a nonpartisan, citizens based forum where we look at issues of concern to local residents. We also serve as a way to um, help keep elected representatives connected with their constituents, especially during these challenging times of uh, COVID 19. So we'd like to express our gratitude to Tri-Cities Community Television for filming our interviews and allowing us to reach out to a broader audience. Today we're filming on, at, on site at the village of Anmore and we are on unceded Coast Salish territories. Joining us today is Mayor John McEwen and we're going to be talking about uh, what makes Anmore special. So a little, learning a little bit more about Anmore. We'll also be talking about some environmental initiatives in Anmore as well as respectful workplace which is a theme that's been common to all of our interviews. So today you'll notice that none of us are wearing masks. We are well into the second wave of the pandemic but we are respecting all of the provincial health um, regulations by maintaining our six feet or two meter distance. Before and after the interviews, we've all been wearing our uh, masks and there's sanitation protocols in place at the uh, Village of Anmore um, Council and, and City Hall as well. So um, thank you, Mayor McEwen, for joining us today. And um, I think we're looking, really looking forward to chatting with you and learning more about Anmore. Good. Well, welcome to you both to the beautiful village of Anmore. Thank you. So, Thank you. And yeah. I think maybe we could just start off by, if you could tell us just a little bit more about Anmore, what makes it special and how is it different from uh, the Tri-Cities and the surrounding area? Um, well, most people don't even really realize they're in Anmore as they're driving to and from Bunsen Lake, which, as we all know from uh, media reports has become a hot spot in the lower mainland of people to flock to in the summer and also throughout the season now because there's a, a great 45 minute hike that goes right around it. I think it's about 12 kilometers but it is it is breathtaking around the lake. So um, Anmore is comprised of about 765 hectares. Um, not all of Anmore is built out. Uh, we have some big large tracts of land that are still uh, have development potential and as a council we're really looking at innovative ways to be able to develop those lands. Um, but what makes Anmore so special? I, I would say that um, it's the little secret that now is getting out and in regards to that you know when I moved here uh, 15 or I bought land here 20 years ago um, uh, born and raised on the North Shore um, I looked for a place that sort of resembled the North Shore as I grew up, that I was able to play in the creeks, uh, get out, you know, play hide and seek in the woods, um, build a fort in the woods, and, that, and that's what brought me out here with my family and, and, and my young son. And, um, um, you know, so when I told people back in, in where I lived in the, on the North Shore that I had just bought a uh, parcel land out here in Anmore, they're like, well, where is that? And really, it was it was an under, underseen, under, um, you know, kind of it, it was completely under the radar. And um, so, you know, when I bought land out here and then built a house, and predominantly most of the land here is one acre. Um, although we've seen challenges with some of the topography, we're now down to you know most of the houses. I would say the average house size is about half an acre to an acre. Um, but it's more sort of, you know, people wanted to, to, that moved out here, wanted land to be able to build what they wanted to build, have a big yard, their own natural park, be able to have a carriage house that, you know, extended family could stay in and live with them and that. So, um, but, un but unfortunate to some, fortunate to others, Anmore is really becoming on the map now. Um, and a lot of it is, if you don't realize, is that it's quicker to get from Anmore to downtown Vancouver than it is most places on the North Shore now because of traffic congestion. This was pre-COVID, of course. And you know that you've just let the secret out of the bag there. The secret has been out of the bag for, I would say, probably about the last uh, 10 years. You know, value of land um, has gone from an acre being $200,000 to now 
$2 million. So it has really, and it's all about, it gets back to sort of real estate 101, which is location, location, location. You know, we truly are eight minutes away from a SkyTrain station here. And you're in a spectacular setting right in the middle of the temperate rainforest, yep. um, beautiful landscape, and, and yet so close to all the amenities and so surrounding areas. Yeah. Which, you know, causes a bit, of, uh, a bit of uncomfortableness for those people that have lived here, you know, 30 or 40 years. They're, they were used to the gravel roads. They were used to having a well on their property for, for water and, and minimal services. Well, now the people that are moving here that have found the hidden gem are wanting those services. They're wanting paved roads. They're wanting a uh, nice trail network that they can go jogging on or biking on or take a, a kid's stroller on. So these are the challenges that we're really finding that, that, that cause a little bit of angst in our community. But that's, but that's common to all communities. Yeah. They're, all communities are going to evolve into something a little bit more modern. 100%, and that's the yeah. problem that we have. You know, change is happening around us. We, we can't, you can't stop change. Yeah. You know, the value of this land, of the properties here, is really been indicative of our location. And, and I would argue that Port Moody was probably in a similar sense, instance 80 years ago. You know, they were probably a rural setting and just, you know, population growth. It, it just, but with that, it, it becomes big challenges. You know, we have two schools. Uh, we have an elementary school and a middle school here um, in, within, the, within the confines of the municipality. And we notice right now that our elementary school, you know, would normally have a, a, about 180, 200 kids in it, is down to about 120. And as a council, we're seeing the problem with, the sort of the genie being out of the bottle in regards to Anmore and, and the value is that what we're building right now, if we keep to the one acre minimum, we're building, you know, four to ten million dollar estates. Mm -hmm. Not conducive to a young family who's starting up like when I was when I moved here. So so we're really as a council having to look at that and go, we need to have a varying uh, a sort of dense densification and a different sort of housing stock to be able to facilitate younger families and also older families that don't want to maintain an acre land. Because I can tell you, when I first moved here, I was on two acres. And the dream of driving around on the lawnmower, mowing the lawn, I loved it. Yeah. It gets a little thin after about the third or fourth year, <laughs> so to speak, you know? And you're spending two hours out there loaning and bagging lawn and then having to put, you know, moss killer on it and stuff to try and, and, and that. So it, it does find its challenges. So now what we're finding, you know, these big estates that are getting built now, because they're upwards of, you know, five to ten million dollars, these people aren't engaging as much in the community as what used to happen when we were there. There was a lot of volunteer, we'd build trails, we'd, you know, we'd come and do events and, and that. That's not as engaged and a lot of the kids from these families that are moving in are going into then the private schools. They're not engaging in the public school system. So. That, that's one of the big challenges we have as, as we're evolving. I think that's an interesting um, sort of scenario because it's quite different from the challenges that some of the surrounding areas um, are, are sort of faced with. And we'll come back and talk more about some of these challenges in a little bit because they are really interesting and unique to Anmore. Um, but there are other challenges right now that we're all facing as well with respect to the pandemic and COVID-19 and it's affected all levels of government and individuals. Can you tell us a little bit about how it's affected Anmore, given your different demo um, demographics and, well, and how you're handling that? You know, it was one of the things that really, uh, we really struggled with because when the pandemic hit, we really realized how ill-prepared we were. Um, we never had had the electronic equipment here to hold virtual meetings. So, boom, we had to go out and, and spend, luckily, some of the money that came from the, the federal government in regards to the COVID response about being able to facilitate that. We don't want to have, we still need to carry on the business of the village. However, we can't continue it on the way it was. So we noticed that. The other thing that we really noticed that if at one point, because we were in uncharted territory, they thought that there may be a possibility that we may have to start segregating different municipalities because of the outbreak like they're doing provincially. And what facilities did we have here to be able to distribute food, to possibly allow people to um, segregate and, and, and quarantine? And stay within, and right, within yeah, Anmore yeah. as opposed to moving yeah. outside this area. We didn't have that. And that really has put the push on our new village hub, which I will 
show you some pictures of which we're going to be building where the old Mom Murray household there, which will have one of the things that came out of it was we should have some sort of a food prep area mm -hmm. in case we need to be able to, and a big storage area to be able that if, if we did get a lockdown from a municipal point of view, they'd be able to bring food up here. We could then distribute it to, to the residents and that. Right. Food security is always yeah. an issue, even in, in the best of times. Yeah. Um, uh, and I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if people understand with Anmore, you're a little bit locked into Fort Moody. You, yeah. In order to access Anmore and Valcara, you have to, um, you have to move through Fort Moody at yeah. the very least. 100%. We have to, uh, on both of our connections, which is East Road, we go right through Port Moody out down to David. Right. And then through the Ioco Road, we're into Port Moody down there as well. So we are transversing through Port Moody either way and that so and we actually as a municipality get our Metro Vancouver water we actually purchase it through Port Moody because right. there isn't a pipe going up into here directly mm -hmm. so we have to pay them and then they charge us an, uh, an upcharge for pumping it up the hill and and all their infrastructure of course and, and so that speaks to that food insecurity yeah. if the government says we're going to be locked down that's the only access. Yeah. That that's the only access to for food to come through. To we have we have no buildings. Like we in the the building that we're sitting right now. So we have three Adco trailers that we purchased when the previous Ma Murray household became condemned, right. um, and those are where our offices are being in. But these council chambers, we rent these on a monthly basis. We were boring uh, portables at the school for uh, probably a couple of years, but however, they needed those portables. So we had to actually go and buy these, or rent these, so we rent these on a month-to-month -month basis. Right. Interesting, though. Um, you did receive um, a grant, a federal grant, for COVID and COVID yeah. preparedness and, and things like that. And you did mention how you'd spent some of that money on electronic equipment yeah. to be better connected and better prepared in that respect. Um, can you tell us maybe is there another way that you'll be spending that money as well? Can you share with us yeah. some, maybe to address no, some of these No, one of the issues? benefits that we have over a lot of the other municipalities is, is that we have this open space. So we had to do a lot of signage in regarding to make sure that people were respecting the social distancing according to the Dr. Henry's the health, health orders. Um, we had to do a lot re regarding our, our front end desk in regards to protective um, plastic, you know, for, for that, as well as a lot of electronic to be able people to pay electronically. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of stuff from the, uh, that you don't maybe, it's not the stuff that you see quite out front, but that you see behind the scenes that really needed to be able to facilitate the business of the village. Um, you know, we had to do a lot of protective thing down with our public works department and that because, again, we provide a service and it's, uh, it's looking after, after the the residents that live here. I'll tell you the one great thing is seeing so many of our residents out walking around the neighborhood. You know, I'd be, you know, out working in my yard and it, it was great to be able to see all the people that aren't normally out enjoying. We, we're so fortunate to be able to have these open spaces to get out, you know, because when the first part of the COVID uh, started, it was, you couldn't, they were shutting down municipal parks because they were being so overwhelmed, you know, and we did have some big challenges with Bunsen Lake. As, as we all know. It, especially during the summer. Especially during the summer. You know, they limited because they didn't want, their, the beach portion is so small, they didn't want, the, they wanted the social uh, distancing to be respected. So um, we had to really spend a lot of money on traffic control management to keep people moving so that when the, when the lake was full, there's normally 600 parking stalls and they cut it down in half just to limit the amount of people. So it caused us a lot of angst in regards to bylaws as well, to, that people weren't just parking, you know, throughout the street, so. I know I turned, I got turned back from Bunsen Lake once. It's one of my favorite places to hike around yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, and also there's the one-way trail system put yeah. in there now and different things, so definitely lots of changes to Yeah, me. so Bunsen, just so we're clear, Bunsen is owned, uh, it, it, the, the lake itself is in Anmore, but the, the lake itself was, ma was man-made and it was a power generation lake. So that's why Hydro has tight control. They control all the parking, all the park of it. You know, their main focus isn't the park. But they've done a really good job as of late working with us because it's become such a sought after place to go. I, I think along this vein, um, along the COVID vein, and as you mentioned that there's a lot more you had to do around Bunsen, how, how is, are you finding the interaction of your, of 
your employees of Anmore, how is the interaction with the public, and how are your employees in this time holding up? We are, first of all, we're very, very fortunate with the employees here. They are our greatest asset. They know most of the people. You know, we have 100 residents here. We're about 2,500 people. Believe it or not, a lot of the employees here know people that live here and that. So it's been tough in that regard. You know, I've talked to a few of them because a lot of them, um, our CAO, Ms. Julie Halliwell, has done a great job in regards to, you know, doing work separation and making sure that some of them are working from home. And it, it's been great, but they've really missed the camaraderie of working in, in the office. And it's one of the things that we really, uh, really look after. I know in public works, they're fairly, it's been fairly kind of status quo because, you know, we have different vehicles they're out doing their own thing trail rebuilding so they're out in the air they're, they're not having to work in these confined spaces but it's been tough on on the employees you know with this yeah yeah they miss the camaraderie they miss the closeness of working with you know whether it's the building department the development department the social end of things the finance all those sorts of things have become very challenging we we have done an amazing job carmen uh who is head of our uh, communications and she's my personal um, assistant is she does an amazing job and so she does we have a, a email blog that goes out we have I think about 70% of the village now gets the um, they can sign up to certain email status at level one two or three for what sort of information they want and she's wow. sending out information all the time in regards to latest updates with COVID latest updates with the park parking we're doing a bunch of uh, road works right now so the communication key is the key thing that we're really trying the best to make sure that everybody's well informed that, sorry to, i didn't mean to interrupt you're saying that 70 percent of the po population yep. for the most part is connected to that email thing the village, In, uh, email blast. blast yeah that goes that's out. awesome yeah it's, it's been really good and it's yeah. a, it's such a valuable tool yeah. to be able to get information out well, it's interesting because that was one of the questions that I was thinking of asking you. How do you keep connected with your constituents during these times when everybody, you know, is maybe um, doing different things than they usually would do? But you're saying even walking and you're running into people and you're seeing people and, and now you're connecting via email and it sounds like it's quite a connected community. Yeah, and sometimes that's good and sometimes that can be bad because, you know, quite often I'll be, if something goes wrong and they don't get the answer that they want at the village hall. I'm getting a phone call on my home phone. John, what's going on here? You know, I need to talk to you and stuff like that. So, you know, it, it has its, its, its pluses and it has its minuses. But for the most part, I, I love when people phone me up and, because there's nothing worse than in a small community folklore taking over with stuff that isn't true. You know, like, and I'll give you a perfect example, the village hub. Um, you know, we've saved up for the last 10 years, which we'll get into about the financial situation of the village. So we need a center. And, you know, we put it out. We did a, I think it was a class C cost analysis. And it's going to, it's about $6 million. So by the time you put a 15% contingency, it's closer to seven. Folklore had it at $14 million. So it's great when those people phone me up and I go, well, where's this number coming from? This 14 million? Well, that's what I was told. Well, about it. <laughs> yeah, that's, and, and so it's great to be able to, to nip that in the butt and say, well, actually, look, at this is what the professionals have put forth. This is why we're building it to this size because of storage and A, B, and C. And usually by the time, so when we had all the public ho open houses, I was always here. We had them outside. It was great. We were able to socially distance because we don't, we still need to move on with the business of the village. Well, could you maybe tell us a little bit more about the hub and, and what it is and what the goal of it is? I will tell you, I'll just, I've got two props here, so I'll just quickly show you. And so basically, so this is where we are right now in the existing trailers. So the community hub is going to be built right here and it'll look over onto what we call Spirit Park. So it's about, I think the footprint of it is about 5,000 or 6,000 square feet. It'll be two levels. Um, and then the, with the basement being predominantly storage as well as, um, so the main floor will have uh, this section here, which will be a community mixed use for being able to provide, you know, seniors activities, Cub Scouts, um, all sorts of things. And then this will be the administrative end of things. And then storage. Right now, we are completely at capacity in storage here, and we actually have to store off-site. So that's what the footprint looks of how it's going to lay out. And... 
this is what the proposed building will look like. So we will, we're actually, where these people are standing right here, this is very close to where we are right now. So we wanted, in a cost-effective way, to be able to still maintain business by keeping the existing trailers so. going until that's built. And of course, we've had lots of feedback. It looks too contemporary. It looks too, you know. It, you, it, There's always going to be that. You can't. But the key thing is, is that we need to be able to provide something we you know as a community right now we do really four big events a year to, to bring the community together we do easter we do uh, mom murray day which tri-city news has certainly covered on many occasions we do halloween and we do christmas all of those are weather dependent and as people get older they're not able to come out into the elements or you know this will give something that they can all come even inside and watch our fireworks display and you know once we're behind this whole covid Right. community center um, so one of the events you mentioned Ma Murray days yeah. is is unique I believe to this the village of Anmore yeah. did you want to say just a couple of words about what that event is or, or what the day represents Ma Murray was a, a famous newspaper and and they had a summer house here in regards and then they lived up north as well so um, she's kind of gotten some roots here through I don't know from her tenure staying here, but just sort of the romancing of the story of Ma Murray Day. And so the household that, that we ended up have to, to take down was part of her homestead in which, in which she stayed. So we try and, you know, we're very dear to our roots. And as you look around, we have a lot of storyboards as to, as to the history and that. So she plays a prominent role in the history. And, we, and that's why we always wanted to kind of commemorate that as the first weekend in September is Ma Murray Day. Right. No, interesting to have yeah. your own unique sort of right. culture as yeah. well. Yeah. And to build around that. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm curious, I'm still, I'm thinking about what you call the community hub. Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, something that I've been meaning to ask through this is, what is the population here? Like about 2,500 right now. 2,500 yeah. people. Yeah. Okay. And I think, you know, I think projections could take it up, could double that fairly quickly. Okay. And now, right. so okay, so that make um, so I'm starting to put that into yeah. into my head in terms of how large the community is and why it's a village as opposed to being a, 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 a I guess the next thing is a city. Yeah. Well, you look at yeah. Whist Whistler is referred to as a village. Yes. Right. You know, and their population there is about ten ten to eleven thousand. Right. That that are there full time. Yeah. 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 And then yeah. there's a population yeah. of people coming in. Mm -hmm. and out. That's right. I think I think at this point maybe what we should do is begin to move to the environmental issue so. of this area yeah. because because you know I see I see Anmore is it in the rainforest which is fantastic but I'm see I'm I'm interested in what's going on with um, climate change how you feel about that and knowing that you're right in the middle of a forest so. A lot of municipalities do kind of a climate change audit. You know, we, we have looked at that. Unfortunately, you know, we don't have, we don't, we don't have a big carbon footprint. You know, if you look at our building here, it's fairly small. One of the things that we're really going to be cognizant is making this as carbon neutral as we can, the new building, without going to the LEED standard, which is going to be, going to not be able to be facilitated through our budget. But we are certainly going to be looking at that. We, we've had initial, um, projections that this building, although it's going to be about 12 to 14,000 square feet, will actually have less of an impact carbon than what we're in right now because these aren't very well insulated. So our operating costs, because it was one of the concerns that we had, will probably be less than the new building. Um, you know, our fleet of public works vehicles, one of the things we did uh, a few years ago is we realized that we don't need necessarily a lot of big trucks. We do need some, you know, big trucks to be able to do the snow clearing and, and that. But we actually bought uh, a little bobcat, which one of the, uh, Stu, one of our public works, runs around. And he's able then to go on the trails and do trail work and that. And it, it has a little three-cylinder motor on it, so it actually gets incredible fuel economy. Um, getting back to the environment, you know, the, the challenges that we have is with new development. You know, people own this land. They want to develop it it has an impact on the environment. Trees have to come down. You know, we, that's, that's, that's a big issue that we have here. You know, um, people love other people's trees. They don't want their own trees. They love other people's trees. So if a neighboring property, which has been green all this, you know, with trees, goes up for development, people get very concerned about it. Now, is there a, 
um, tree bylaw in place in, in Anmore? Yeah, we do have a tree bylaw, but it's, you know, it's up to the discretion of the professionals, the arborists that come and do a report. And, and again, you know, trees, as we all know, trees have to come down when you build. We also up here, because we're not on sewer predominantly, septic fields have to go in, which is another area that has to be cleared for trees. We also have a lot of creeks. You know, one of the, one of the best examples is Mossam Creek runs right through, right through Anmore. And we have, since I've been on council for 12 plus years, we've really focused to make sure that that water stays crystal clear, that sedimentation doesn't go into it, doesn't get polluted. We protect those areas. And we found that the best way to protect them is to put those areas in the public trust. So rather than leaving them as part of a, a, a property that's owned, because inevitably it gets manicured, better to leave it in the public trust so then you have people that become public stewards and make sure that there's nothing going into the creek. And I have to be honest, we haven't had the complaints, you know, from, from Ruth Foster at the Mossam Creek Hatchery that we had many, many moons ago. And I think she would say that we're, 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 being, we're doing a good job. You know, we really respect the, the creeks. Her work is, is, is unbelievable that she does down there and, and that I wish that we had more trails going down there to be able to get more kids in there because then they can see the whole, the whole circle of life in regards to how important it is to keep our, our creeks and, 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 and because it's the challenge here that we have as well because we don't have a storm drain. A lot of these areas, be, nevertheless, will trickle into the creeks. You know, the the all the um, you know the runoff from roofs and stuff like that. So we're also doing some stuff in our building, by uh, making sure that we control that, make sure the water that is going eventually into those creeks as runoff is clean and it's clear and it's good for the fish. Right, and and the your your community is aware of that and they're yeah. supportive of that. Very well. supportive of it. We have an environment committee here that is very, you know, we're now tackling because we've kind of really put some good work into that, making sure that construction and development is far enough away from creeks. Um, we're now putting our work into evasive plants and stuff like that as well to make sure. I just have one burning question yeah. about your greenway strategy. Yeah. Um, you have a strategy that you're implementing to connect green spaces and to protect green spaces. So, Can you tell us a little bit more about that? So fortunate for me, I'm actually chair of the Metro Vancouver Regional Parks and we are working on a greenway strategy there which would connect New Westminster to downtown Vancouver. And believe it or not, it's almost level the whole way. You go through Burnaby Lake and, and all that. And But what we do is we need to take over some right-of-ways. We need to be able to make it so that you're not having to cross traffic and that. And that's what we're working on right now. So that's an extension of it up here. One of the big things that people have said to us is they would love nothing more than to be able to walk to different areas of the village through trail connection. And so that's what we're working on right now. Unfortunately, that takes time. We don't own all the land, so we're actually asking some homeowners or some property owners if we can get right-of-ways on it because it's, you know, it may be right near a creek, so we don't, they're not going to be able to build there, so we're trying to work that out, as well as we have a high-pressure line that runs through here uh, from, from Fortis, um, working with them about connecting there, but we've got a few issues, some capital projects, like a bridge to cross Mossam Creek that uh, would really connect the village. So it's a big, big focus uh, is, the, is the greenways up here and people being able to go out and, and walk around and, and that. No, that's, I think it's a great initiative and I'd love to see it spread even further. <laughs> yeah, it is, it really is, so. That's great. Yeah. Now, you were saying that trees, of course, are coming down due to development. Is there any strategy in place to replant or to maintain some In our areas? tree bylaw, yeah, we do have that. But, you know, the other issue that we really have is the wildfire issue. You know, it's concerning. We've been very fortunate the last few summers that we've been able to get, you know, a rainy period in between a, a, a very hot, dry period. But I know even in my own yard, climate change is having an effect. I had to take out about, I think it was about 14 hemlocks. They just died. They weren't able to handle, they're a very temper, temperamental tree and uh, they weren't able to handle the heat and the dryness of the summer. So they all turned brown. I had to get a, you know, a tree company in there to take them down. But one of the things, because I sit on, as, on one of the fire, the Sassamat Volunteer Fire Trustees, we have a volunteer fire department here, is the challenge of going, we need to be careful. You know, in theory, what we should be doing is building a, a ring around the, the entire village 
wide enough to be able to prevent a, a wildfire infringing on the village. You know, it, it is concerning. It is very, very concerning. So how do you balance that? It's a tough one for sure because the more trees that come down that, it, you know, for climate change, one of the best things you can do is plant trees yeah. and yet you don't want to put people at risk. Yeah. So it's a challenging we're, balancing. Yeah, it. so we do some things in our building code. We're training, changing over to non-combustible surfaces on a lot of our, our new construction and that making sure that uh, you know houses are well sprinklered in regard you know that are on the outskirts but it is a challenge it, and, and it's something that I think um, you know I'm I look at uh, a development right near us Ravenswood which was done I guess about I'm gonna say it was just before my time being on council so it was about 15 years old it's one of the most idyllic streets in Anmore it's beautiful it, was designed perfectly, but they designed it on the pretense that let's keep a lot of these existing trees. Well, unfortunately, you leave one or two, there's been three houses hit by the trees from the, from the severe windstorms that we're having now. A lot of the trees have died. But the good thing is, is the new stuff that was planted 15 years ago is starting now to come in. So, you know, what we're thinking now is during a development, maybe it's best that we get bigger trees to get replanted in there to grow within the structures, the septic fields, the drainage and all that sort of thing is probably the better route to go. Yeah, I think it's a learning experience it and is. it sounds like you're drawing on that experience to move forward. So You that's can't please to, everybody. You know, it's tough. Well, and is that's another question maybe that we should ask is how do you manage all these divergent views? Um, residents that want to cut down trees, residents that like the sort of semi-rural um, atmosphere here. How do you balance that? So what we try and do on developments is we try and work with, with, with the proponent. And we say, look, you can't come in and clear cut your whole three acre parcel. Let's, let's leave areas that are going to be well protected. We'll let you clear in that. And then, you know, of course, you're going to get the neighbors that are going to come in going, oh, I love looking out at those trees. And I will argue with them and say, or I will not argue it, but I'll say to them, well, you do realize when your house was built, the trees were removed. Mm -hmm. You know, if you wanted that land to stay treed, you could buy it. And then you would be able to be in control of it. But we can't control it. And, and how do you take the rights of property owners away from developing their land? Y you can't. You know, they've been paying taxes on that potential and, and that. So, it, you know, I try and have that understanding with people. I think it's important. Um, you know, no, none of us like change. And so, unfortunately, but I try and make sure that as developments come forward, they appease as much as they can. They're, we can't appease everybody. And that, so it's, it's you know, it's, it's that balance. I guess one more interesting um, thing that happened last summer with respect to that sort of balance and, um, you know, having, um, being in a quiet rural area and then all of a sudden you've got these big mansions you're talking about that are going in and last summer we were hearing about big parties with limousines and helicopters. Did you want to talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, and give your you thoughts? know, I'm, how do I start this? Um, I was absolutely blown away at the media attention that it got. And I was somewhat reluctant to be engaged in the media attention because it was giving them everything that they wanted, which was the media attention. And I think there's some reality here that a lot of people have missed in this. Number one is, is that they were actually trespassing. Their rental agreement had come up, had ended two days previous to this party on the Saturday night. So they were actually illegally occupying that home that was being rented out. Number two is, we have a, a volunteer fire department that ca got called out because one of the attendees basically had overdosed and had, for the moment, had died and had to be brought back with a neox naloxalone or whatever in that. So they literally dragged him out the front yard so that the volunteers who could le left their families came and, and took care of this. You know, the third thing is, as I said earlier, we were in the middle of a summer where there was some heat. If some, one of the neighbors were having a fire and you were having these helicopters land, it could have been problematic. The whole forest could have gone up. So the complete disregard for our community was, was appalling. Then I receive a phone call from the fellow who hosted the party saying, oh, I owe you an apology. I said, you actually owe our whole community an apology. And especially those volunteers that came and saved one of your friends from complete, utter, 
you know, I, I can't even describe how, what a bad decision this was. Then I follow up though, and I have to be honest with you, we have, we have been pushing Transport Canada, the Vancouver Sun did an article on it, as to what the penalty was or what the fine was. And they have been so reluctant, they won't even come to a council meeting and tell us. We have been told that each of the helicopters and the pilots was fined $750. For flying low in a community For coming, like for landing in a community that they're not allowed to be, in a residential community, that they're not allowed to, to land here. And, and I'm like, why, my question to them is this, is why wouldn't you suspend their licenses immediately while that investigation went on for a year? Mm -hmm. They didn't even do that. It was sort of a, you're right, it did receive a lot of media yeah. attention, uh, at least locally for sure. Oh, I, you know, global, uh, uh, yeah, it was, Globe and Mail was, for, it was unbelievable. And it was, and I kept saying at the start of every article, I'd say to the reporters, I go, you do realize I'm doing this reluctantly because I'm having to represent the village of Anmore and, and express how, how disappointed we are but you're giving them everything that they want, and that was, and, and it was, it was in that regards, it was really sad. That's that's an interesting thing, though. That I think that that speaks to that tension between um, respecting your community and your what your own wants are. I mean, that that happens in every community. Yeah. There are very that that kind of various um, that that shows up in various ways. Everywhere there are humans. Yes. So I think I imagine, though, in such a small and tight knit, tight knit community like yours, that's why you seem to be quite emotional, like in the yeah. proper way, emotional and flabbergasted to to some extent about how could somebody think that that kind of behavior is okay. But we're always going to get we're always going to get that. So. Um, I would like to know more of your, I'd like to hear more of what you have to say about that kind of thing. That, you know, it sounds to me like you believe that people have a response, th the community has responsibility to you because you pay taxes, but people have a responsibility to their community as well. Yeah, I, you know, this is, this was in a, a very tight um, residential area, you know, with kids playing on the streets. Um, it, it's it's idyllic for a young family, you know, and, and in this area, there's, uh, you know, at the end of the road is where this house was, which was on an acre of land, this estate, but lead, the road leading up to it, it's all smaller houses. It was part of the McCulloch subdivision, smaller, kind of almost what you'd see residential, so a lot of young families. And the fact that to rent, so they rented this place for a period of time. Um, and then to, to, to throw this party was just, it, it just was so, out of touch with our community and and it really it really offended me because I didn't want Anmore to be known as this place and you know there was all these jokes going around you know we had radio phoning me and stuff oh or you just pissed off that you know you weren't invited no like I was at home going what's going on with these helicopters then I I get the call from the fire department that they're getting called out to it so I was really I, I found it repulsive that, that this was that this happened and 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 reflects on our community this is not what our community is about so is there some way that you can stop this from happening again or is that well, just we, outside of yeah the you know I had some pretty direct conversations with the RCMP because I wondered they did attend I said why didn't you shut it down knowing that the rental agreement had expired they were literally trespassing and they couldn't answer that question but we, we also did some stuff in regards to, um, we now are monitoring all uh, rentals. We try and do our best for rentals, uh, in that, especially because this was rented to an agency. And we, uh, we made up a sheet in regards that we send out to them. Look, at, you are renting uh, a property in Anmore. Please be respectful of your neighbors. This is not for partying. This is not, we don't condone Airbnb for one night. You know, because that's really where the, the issue, I think, could, could really get out of hand. So is, are there Air, uh, Airbnb, is Airbnb an issue in? Not really. I think we have um, like some carriage houses and stuff, but not entire houses. Normally they are of a rental of a yearly basis, but I was a little bit concerned. And I think it's because we're not as convenient 
um, you know, transportation is a bit of a challenge to be able to get these things. But I didn't want, it really worried me because if, if there was an issue that we had a bunch of these houses that were sitting empty, you know, not sure what was happening with the market at, at that period of time. And um, they were sitting empty and I was worried that they were going to become these party, weekend party houses. And so we, we haven't had that issue since, so. And I guess this speaks, I'm just, I'm just gonna push a tiny yeah. bit more on this subject. No, maybe we'll move on in a moment, but um, this speaks to people do have rights in their communities, but they do have responsibilities yeah. as well. Responsibles, responsibility to the community, the greater community and to the people around them. Well, I, I, think, I think the owners of the property have a responsibility that makes sure that if they are going to rent it out, which again is their right, as, as you say, when, and I fully agree with that, but they need to make sure that they're renting out for the purpose that the initial building was built for, you know, and that, and I understand that, you know, people come across financial challenges in life and, you know, they need to rent out their house or they can't sell it and stuff like that, but there has to be a, a, a level of respect to the neighboring, neighboring community in regards to doing that. Right. So I guess, are you okay if we yeah, move on? Um, I, this has all been really interesting. I, I think if we can move on maybe and talk a little bit about your role as mayor and um, you tell us a little bit about city council, how many people are on council and what your roles are. Just give us maybe the 20,000 foot okay. view. <laughs> um. So when I first was on council, so council uh, here is comprised of four councillors and, and, and a mayor. And it is, um, I would say to some, it's, it's a thankless job. You know, we play a lot of roles. Um, and especially as the mayor, I play a ton of roles. It is, it is a full time, especially with the pressure that we're under in regards to the development pressure. You know, I've got meetings later on this afternoon. So it's, you know, and I don't have the staff that my colleagues have in, you know, Port Moody and Coquitlam and Port Coquitlam to be able to facilitate all this. I answer the majority of all the emails that come into me and, and, and that, and you know, we have a very passionate community, which I, I love representing. Um, I love doing things like we're doing right now. I love talking about this amazing community. I think this community has so much potential, but um, you know, I work hard at uh, keeping my council informed. You know, they're all working and very busy, but I usually, I make a list of notes every Monday morning or, or Monday afternoon. I usually try and catch each one of them and reach out and go through everything that, that's doing. We meet every, every other Tuesday for uh, council meetings. Um, you know, as mayor, I'm setting up events. Uh, you know, at Halloween, I'm the one lighting off the fireworks with another fellow who's a trained pyrotechnic, you know. Um, I'm here, I'm out at the road at seven o'clock in the morning on the weekends when Bunsen Lake traffic is backing up because it's having a huge effect on our community and, and I'm there wanting to know what's going on and working with the traffic people. Um, yeah, I'm uh, playing a big role at Metro Vancouver, making sure that our water rates stay as, as, as you know, well as we can, concerned about, you know, working with our fire department. We, we have a Sassamat Volunteer Fire Department is shared between us and Belcara. So it, it's a, it, you know, it's a pretty well run, making sure that we have enough recruits to get involved in the volunteers and, and that. So it's, it's a lot it, it, for the mayor. And, and council, again, it's a bit of a part-time thing, but the mayor, it's, it's, a full, it's, it's, it's easily a full-time thing because, as I said earlier, people don't get the answers they want at the Village Hall they're calling me at home, you know, they know me and they're like, John, I need to understand this. Well, it's interesting because like you say, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, yeah. right? You're, um, you take a lot of things on your own shoulders, yeah. but on the other hand, you're so connected to your community. Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting um, position to be in, yeah. <laughs> although lots of responsibilities go lots along with Lots of responsibilities, sure. yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess one question that we're always interested in is that you're working with a council maybe sometimes there's divergent views different people have different perspectives on things how do you work to make sure that everybody gets heard respectfully and that all those different views um, get airtime that they're all heard I well first of all I think that differing views is very productive for democracy and and I think that what I do and I think it's, it's some people don't is um, I'm respectful of every person on council. Got elected, has the vote, has the same vote as I have. You know, they, 
a vote, I don't carry any more power as a vote. So I realize that in my role, I have to make sure, one, that my council is very well informed because information is key. It gives you the basis to make the best decision possible. And I'm hoping that the decision that they come to will be the same decision I came to because we, have, we share all the same information. So I, I spend a lot of time working with my council, making sure that they are well informed. Do they need any more information? Because these are the decisions that we're going to have to come up. Do you have any questions as to their importance? And because, especially in a small community, you get so much self-interest how this affects an individual may be different than what, it, what it's going to be for the community. I guess that brings another interesting question is, how do you ensure that your constituents are respectfully heard? If they come to you with something that you don't agree with or council doesn't agree with, um, how is that respectfully dealt with? Well, I always, I'm very open in regards, please tell me if you have, I'm not, I'm not the world's smartest man. And I may see, I'd love to be able to, you to give me a different angle to look at. And I openly, you know, we, we do a lot of public hearings, like even with this new village hub, which was a little bit contentious. We had three open houses. I want to hear from people. I, I sent out my own information. Like, Please, if you have concerns, call me up. Let, let's talk about it. You know, and it's, uh, the biggest challenge in this community is their financial sustainability. Mm, okay. To, to keep that going. Yeah. The, the, with a, with a population of 2,500, it must it must be a, a tricky um, a, a a big draw on what resources that you have. Uh, one of the questions that um, I wanted to ask with regards to um, uh, keeping a good flow of information between yourselves and the community is what kind of committees do you are, are you an open do you have open committees yep. and do people we have open committees so we have an environment committee. We have a uh, Parks and Rec Committee. We have, uh, a, a, I forget how, it, it's the C Community Engagement Committee, and that which is all about, you know, events and how we can do more, more events and that. Um, and then we just started up our public, uh, our public security one, which we're gonna get back into the block watch, speed control, parking, um, you know, just to make people, there's a lot of people up here that, you know, are now having to start locking their doors because of the concern of people, more and more people coming up here. It's starting to lock your doors, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're very fortunate, and it's tough for me because sometimes I will go to the um, RCMP, which looks after us, and you know we pay them a certain port portion of our budget for them, and they'll say, well, I say, we need some more help at controlling the traffic at, at Bunsen Lake in the summer, and, and this and that, and they're like, John, there's no, we don't have any calls out there. It's usually false alarm alarms and that. And I said, well, good, then you need to deploy that resources for this and that. So, but you know, we have a good relationship with them. And, uh, and it's all about, I think another key thing is neighbors knowing neighbors, being respectful and, and that, so. So I imagine in Anmore, the majority of the kind of interactions that you have are with residents as opposed to you're not so much dealing with businesses that you're not dealing with a lot of business concerns. No. We, you know, our, yeah, unfortunately we don't have businesses because that would help disperse some of our tax base. We, our income level is basically all residential and then grants that we receive from different levels of government. Um, our biggest entity that we probably deal with on, on an ongoing basis would be BC Hydro because of the Bunsen Lake operations and that as well as some of the power lines and that through here. So really those are, those are our big, big entities and that, um, you know, so. I noticed all through this interview how passionate you are about your community. Can you tell us what, what's your proudest achievement for Anmore? Like what's the thing that really stands out for you? The proudest thing and unfortunately I'm seeing the opposite come true in, in, in our neighboring village of Belcara. They are in a financial mess. Um, they have a $4 million debt on, I think, 300 homes and a water system. And um, my biggest accomplishment is when I first got onto council is recognizing the financial sustainability of the village was in peril. Um, we then hired, uh, I was able to convince some members of council um, to hire a financial, uh, a consultant 
they came and did an a overview as to what we were doing, and they said that we were, in essence, our infrastructure had about a $10 million infrastructure deficit that it needed to be put into it. And I can tell you that as of we speak right now, we have turned that completely around, and we now have about 10 to $11 million in the bank. So we're going to be able to pay for this cash. Um, we're hoping to get some help from the different levels of government uh, to the tune of about maybe they'll cup up about a third to a half of it, which is going to be great. We have not received provincial or federal grants whatsoever. We've kept a, a sheet of 10 years and our, what we've received back from both of them has been very, very minute. I think in the under $500,000. Belcara, which is about a quarter of our size, has received about $6 million. So we are due. We are due. But my proudest thing is that we got out of the financial mess and realized where we were and we did it on our own. We didn't do like you're seeing right now, like the city of Vancouver and all these other cities, crying to different levels of government. We took it on and we did it. And, and it, was, it was tough. You know, we instituted basically a 10% tax increase each year. And we kept compounding and compounding it. We then did an asset management plan. So we know right now all the assets in the village, like every pipe, every bit of road, what its level is. And we know right now that uh, every year, our current assets depreciate at about $750,000 a year. So we are putting, we, we're bringing in about $1.2, $1.3 million. So of that, each year, we're making sure that our assets are all up to, st up to, up to snuff. And we've been able to, to leverage that in some amazing ways. So right now, uh, as you drove in, you would have seen that we're doing a big, huge trail network. We're doing upgrading the roads. We were able, we were already planned to come out and do that this year. So we had allocated about a $2 million budget to do all that. Because of COVID, we were able to take advantage because a lot of the other municipalities, not being in a strong financial situation, had to put off all their capital works. So you had all these crews hungry for work. We were able to get $2 million worth of work done for $1.2 million. So in our municipality, that's a significant savings. We have, you know, because like I said, our you know, we're basically, our tax role is, is, is where we get our income. So we are very cautious of it. We'll be at council meetings and we will argue about whether it's wise to spend $500. You know, we are very, very, and I, we keep a close eye on everything in regards to what finances, you know, that's why even when we started looking at this village hub, let's keep the existing here. We don't want to pay to move it. We have to build within there. We have an existing septic system that we could then utilize. We have all the services there. So those are some things that we really, really wanted to look into and make sure that we're making the best, uh, the best analysis. It also starts to reflect on how we develop the, the economic plan. You know, unfortunately, and I, and I say this to my fellow mayors, without a strong financial situation, you're not protecting the environment. You're not protecting the trees. You're not building complete communities. You know. Well, I get, um, it sounds like you've got that, put a lot of thought into that, and that it, it is an accomplishment for sure. Um, what's something that you would still like to see accomplished? And, that, and that's what I was thinking about as well as you were speaking. Those are, the, those are the things that you're proud of. What is your dream? What's the dream for this community at, as you go forward? So my or dream... Or as it goes forward, yeah. say, without you one day. Yeah, so my... <laughs> <laughs> Quite possibly. <laughs> yeah, so my, dr my dream would be, one, is to have this built. We should have this built by the end of this next election cycle. Um, I would certainly like to um, run again because there is some things left. I'd like to be able to um, become a complete community. And what I mean by that, having varying different housing stocks here to be able, as we started the interview, talking about getting younger families back into the community allowing people to age in place into smaller places that they don't have to maintain a yard. There's so many key components that younger families, that means there's people that wanting to be involved in the community, wanting to be involved in the, in the volunteer fire department, all these sorts of things. I would love nothing more than to be able to have a really intricate trail connection with all the capital projects that we need to do by crossing the creeks and being able to get to and from the schools very quicker than you could drive if we could put this, this bridge across Mossum Creek. I would also like to be able to, with some of the new developments and the land that is available, do a, put in a legacy fund so that really this, the funding would be able to be put into a bank, kind of like what they did in Alberta, so that we would never ever have to worry 
down the road about a financial situation or something coming up. And then we could actually keep our taxes low because that legacy fund would create interest income and, and that in regards to doing things. That, it sounds like you guys, you, you guys have done an exceptional job in here. You, you and your council have done an exceptional job here in Anmore. Um, it's extraordinarily interesting to mm. hear a, about your community. I've lived mm. in uh, the Tri-Cities for 35 years and it, 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 to be honest, it's still a little bit of a mystery to me. So it's yeah. very exciting to come. It's very enlightening. Yeah, yeah. Good. It, it's, good. And it's lovely to hear. It's lovely to hear somebody have this much passion for their community and have a solid plan as you're going forward. So as we wrap up, I'd like to say thank you. You're uh, welcome. Mayor John McEwen, yeah. uh, the Mayor of Anmore, for taking this time with us today. Oh. Um, and we look forward and thank you very much for watching. Good.